Mm-hmm. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacific Radio Network. I'm Robert Knight in New York. And we are now joined live by Arnie Gunderson, a nuclear engineer, a licensed plant operator, expert witness, and technologist of the consultancy organization Fairwinds Associates based in Vermont. And Arnie, it is so good to have you back. There's so much going on in the world. Welcome back to 5 O'Clock Shadow. Hi, Robert. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Well, let's begin with uh, an issue of some concern that we discussed uh, not so long ago, and that is the Rockabye Baby overstuffed spent fuel tank <laughs> that is perched high atop a structurally unsound building that has had its uh, outer edifice blown away. And uh, now there are new alarming thermal problems. What is the very latest you know about that? Well, let's back up just a hair and, and realize that when you shut a nuclear reactor down, you don't make the heat go away um, because, uh, well, the chain reaction has stopped. The pieces that are broken off, called fission products, stay hot. So the, the fuel pool at Unit 4 is not undergoing a chain reaction, but there's enough pieces from previous um, uh, fissions that, it's, that it remains very, very hot. Well, what happened this week um, is that uh, both of the cooling pumps failed, and uh, now the temperature has uh, has gone up about uh, about 10 degrees uh, Celsius, or about 18 degrees, in the last two days. It still has got a couple of um, a couple of days to go before it boils, and hopefully they'll buy some new pumps at the True Value or something like that before it, it gets uh, to that point, but. You know, this is a jury-rigged system. Uh, the, um, the original system was blown to smithereens last year, and they've, uh, they've simply jury-rigged pipe together. And uh, um, the, the, main pipe failed, the main pump failed on Tuesday, and the backup pump failed on Wednesday. This is um, following their attempt to cool things down with a fire hose, correct? Yes. Yes. So, you know, the backup to the backup is that if it starts to boil, they'll... They'll squirt water in through um, uh, through a fire hose to prevent it from uh, uh, from boiling dry. Um, but I, I think the bigger picture is what you talked about at the uh, uh, the first couple sentences of your your rockabye baby scenario. Um, the building is damaged, and uh, it's actually Tepco Tokyo Electric has announced that it's bulging on the side. Um, while the fuel uh, pool seems to be flat right now. The building has developed a bulge in it. So if there's a seismic event, the uh, the pool may crack, in which case a fire hose is not going to keep filling it, um, or the uh, or the building could collapse, in, in which case we're, we're where no science has gone before. Um, no one has ever anticipated, uh, you know, several nuclear reactor cores lying out on the ground, uh, unable to be cooled. So um, it... Um, it could easily result in um, a large portion of Japan being uninhabitable because the fuel will catch fire. There was a situation where the spent fuel pool number four was overloaded because of the removal of fuel from yet another reactor. And Ernie, I'm uncertain which scenario would be for the better. If the pool stays inside the building without collapsing and uh, the water is unable to be brought in to keep it cool, then you have a lot of fuel proximate to each other, the pellets and the rods. And if it falls, then presumably these rods would scatter at a greater distance from each other. What is the difference between those two scenarios? Um, I think it's it's better if the fuel stays uh, proximate to each other. Um, but if it falls, I don't think it will scatter. I think it'll just fall into a lump that will be uncoolable, um, uh, which is which is the worst case because then, of course, the center of it is it can't be um, would, would would increase in temperature to the point where the uh, zirconium clad could um, uh, could catch fire. Um, uh, th- this has been studied before. Uh, uh, Brookhaven National Labs. Um, you know, right near New York City, uh, studied a fuel pool fire, and uh, um, they were talking about having to, um, uh, you know, 186,000 people may develop cancer as a result. 
and that was less radioactive material in the fuel pool they studied than what's in Fukushima. So it's, um, you know, I tell my friends in Japan, uh, when you wake up every morning, take a look at the at the live cameras and make sure Unit 4 is still standing. And if it is, you can go to work that day. But if it's not, you know, have a backup plan. Well, there is more to the issue of cool, clear water and the maintenance of a cooling system and the pumping and circulation of water. And... Uh, I understand that you have learned that there has been a failure of that potential in many other places than merely Unit 4 of Fukushima Daiichi. Yeah, you know, I was talking about this on, on CNN the very first week of the accident. Um, but the tsunami, uh, the, the, the industry would like you to believe that the tsunami wiped out the diesels. Uh, they flooded the diesels, and nobody has diesels placed like that, so therefore we don't have to worry. But that's not what happened. The, the, the tsunami wiped out the pumps that are near the water. They're called service water pumps. And they, um, uh, and every plant has to have the pumps near the water because that's where the water is. So the, um, these service water pumps were destroyed. And, um, at Fukushima, uh, Daiichi, which is, which means Fukushima 1, there were six units. In Fukushima Daini, in Fukushima 2, there were four units. Um, a little further down the coast was a, a plant called Anagawa, which had uh, three units, and a little further down the coast was a plant called Tokai, which had one unit. So that's 15 nuclear units. The pumps that cooled the diesels failed on most of those, and 24 of the 36 diesels between those 15 nuclear plants were wiped out. So we almost had 15 meltdowns and not three. It would have been um, uh, you know, species threatening had we had to, had to, had that occurred. We really came way too close. We're speaking with Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. He is also the author of the Japanese bestseller in the Japanese language that is called Fukushima, the truth and the future. And Arnie, there is yet another consequence of conditions in Japan that is a matter of concern for the entire planet. We have uh, recently read uh, scientific reports saying that blue-tailed tuna have now swum across the Pacific Ocean in their uh, seasonal migrational patterns, and that they have been found with elevated levels of cesium, I think 137 and 34, that uh, could be characteristic only of the effluence that is still going into the Pacific from the Fukushima site. I remember we spoke a long time ago, and you warned us that we had one year to have our last Pacific tuna if we did not want to be irradiated. What is your um, understanding of the uh, oceanic issue here? Yeah, it's probably uh, more serious than, than, than what, what you just said. It's, it's truly frightening. What happened was these fish were caught um, back five months after the accident. So an accident happened in March, April, May, June, July, August. The fish were caught in August and analyzed in August but the research wasn't published until June of this year. So it's not like these fish were, were caught recently. Um, the scientists sat on this information for eight or nine months while they were waiting to get their report published. So what happened was right after the accident, these fish picked up some radiation and then started to swim east. And they were caught four months later off of San Francisco. Um, now, they got a little bigger and they excreted some of that cesium, but but they still had uh, body burdens of both kinds of cesium, 134 and 137, that um, uh, uh, that were surprisingly high for, for a fish that had only been near Fukushima for a couple weeks. So my question is, what's been going on since then? Because we know that cesium has been continually... Um, being released from groundwater leaks into the ocean, as well as being deposited from all these plumes. Um, it's likely that um, the, the next catch of tuna that hasn't made the scientific literature yet is going to be worse than the tuna that they caught. They caught 15 tuna, and all 15 had high levels of, of cesium-134 and 137 in them. So it wasn't just... Um, 
I'd like to say a fluke, but that's a fish, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're talking about, Arnie, we're talking about not flukes, but hot tuna. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it wasn't just a, um, uh, you know, a scientific anomaly. They went 15 for 15, and every one of these tuna was um, had high levels of cesium-134 and 137. And that, that, that both of those isotopes are there is, uh, is the Fukushima signature. You know, we are sure the, the Daiichi accident caused those tuna to become contaminated. There's another matter of concern here. You spoke about the levels measured in this uh, set of samples uh, having perhaps previously been greater because the tuna may have excreted some of the material with the cesium, radioactive cesium in it. But what troubles me even about that scenario is this. We know that uh, the larger fish, the blue tail, the yellowfin uh, tunas, are large fish that um, the radioactive material that goes down to the bottom that uh, is consumed by plankton or by crustaceans or scavengers makes its way up the food chain as increasingly larger fish eat the smaller things. So, I mean, is it possible to say even that the excreted cesium is uh, outside of the food chain? Uh, yes, it's certainly, um, you know, they've already detected it in the water column from the surface all the way down to the, um, uh, to, you know, to the, the bottom of the ocean. Um, and, and, uh, and are seeing it in all of the, uh, all of the things you were talking about, in the plankton, in the snails, in, um, they actually have something they call snow. And it's just particles that were deposited on the water and they're working their way down through the water column. And it's, it's loaded with cesium, which these tuna and other fish are swimming through. So the, uh, the concentration in the small fish is actually higher than these tuna. So one would expect that now as, as uh, more and more tuna start to swim toward the United States, we'll, uh, we'll see higher and higher levels of, of uh, radioactivity in the tuna. And I don't think that trend is going to stop for the, the next several years. Arnie, there's one other thing relative to Fukushima that I feel we must uh, cover, and that is the airborne contamination that uh, accompanied the earliest uh, days and months of the disaster at Fukushima. And uh, how does the scale of the atmospheric propagation of the contamination factor into the risk the well, the entire planet is that. Well, the atmospheric numbers are down this year. You know, the the worst atmospheric numbers came in March, April, and May. And the uh, you know, as far as the U.S. goes, the worst area that got hit was the Cascade Range on, on the west coast. Um, the plants now are releasing relatively little amounts of, of uh, airborne radiation. The basements are still leaking like sieves and into the groundwater and into the ocean, but uh, the airborne releases now are much less than uh, um, than they were back in March, April, and May. So you know, what's on the ground now in the Cascades is, um, uh, is about as bad as you can expect, and it will go down with time. Uh, whereas that's not true with the with the fish and the, you know the, 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 what's going on in the ocean, Woods Hole has estimated that uh, uh, Fukushima is ten times worse for the aquatic systems than was Chernobyl. Hardy Gunderson is with Fairwinds Associates. He's the author of the Japanese book called uh, Fukushima, The Truth in the Future. And uh, Arnie, I'd like to turn our discussion to domestic issues and uh, begin with some uh, alarming uh, news that continues to seep out from the Fort Calhoun nuclear station in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, as, as you and many of our listeners may know, it was flooded and was on the edge of a deluge and uh, malfunction of um, even greater degree than it already suffered. And we are now hearing that there have been whistleblowers from inside the, the plant who are saying that the situation is worse, whether it's with crackage or brittleness or whether it's uh, the consequences or implications of the fire that took place there. Do you have new information in regard to the conditions at Fort Calhoun? Well, you know, Fort Calhoun is a, is a small plant. It's only 500 megawatts, and most of the plants are twice as big. One of the first plants built 
and it's owned by a little municipal called Omaha Public Power District. So they really don't have a big institution behind them to help them out. And they've got a staff of five or 600 people for this plant. And it's been shut down. Uh, they shut it down preemptively. Knowing the flood was coming, they decided, well, we're not going to start this sucker up. They kept it down. But the flood was so severe that it saturated the groundwater, and there still remains all sorts of questions about what the foundations are like. Then I, we had this discussion a year ago about the fire. They had a, uh, a uh, some safety-related wiring catch fire, and the fuel pool was without cooling for a period of time as a result. And now they're in a, a cascading management breakdown where um, you know, people are coming forward with more and more problems, and uh, management is just face is being inundated by problems that employees are bringing forward, whistleblowers, and and within their system, and they're so small, you know, that they can't um, they can't rely on a larger institution to help them out. Um, I, I've seen this happen before, and and when a plant gets in this mode, um, you either uh, you know shut it down forever and say. You know, screw it. It's just not worth repairing this plant. It's too small. Or you say, if to do it right, we're going to be shut down for two years and um, uh, and begin a management process to tackle these problems one at a time. And eventually, you'll you'll solve you'll be solving them faster than they're arising. But right now, what's happening in Fort Calhoun is the problems are popping up faster than they can solve them. Which uh, takes us to. The other major development of uh, recent days, and that is the institution that does regulate or is uh, nominally the regulator of nuclear power plant operations. There has been a climax to a, a stunning series of assaults on the leadership at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the person of the chair, Gregory Yazko, and... Uh, Having been dragged through a congressional hearings about his, quote, management style, now he has announced his imminent resignation, uh, presumably due to those ongoing pressures. What do you make of that makeover of the NRC currently? You know, in the last two months, I've had two meetings with Chairman Yasko, and uh, he is not anti-nuclear or anything like the, the nuclear industry portrays him to be. He, he's just a regulator trying to do his job. And the other four commissioners at the, at the NRC um, you know, simply believe that the industry has got adequate regulation and doesn't need to be regulated. What happened um, uh, in the last couple months is that the, uh, uh, the nuclear industry, through its allies in Congress, was able to... Um, retaliate against the chairman and make his life so miserable that he just basically said, I, I'm going to resign. I, I don't need this anymore. He's been there eight years, five years as a commissioner and three years as a uh, as a chairman. And um, um, he was on Harry Reid's staff before that. Uh, the industry is very upset that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission under Yasko's uh, uh, tutelage um, took um, shut down the um, the waste facility out at uh, Yucca Mountain. And I think this is all about trying uh, a, a desperation move to get Yucca Mountain started back up again. And in order for that to happen, the industry had to get rid of Chairman Yasko. And, um, uh, you know, it just got to the point where um, it was just too much for him. And I can't blame him. It was, you know, you can't go through that many congressional hearings and pressure in the press and things like that and uh, um, and, and stay, um, you know, a coherent human being. What is the strategic interest of the nuclear industry in resuscitating yucca? Well, yucca is the, is the only game in town. You know, it was um, without a waste facility, uh, to start the process again is going to take 10 or 20 more years. And the um, uh, the industry wanted to believe that Yucca was the right place to put nuclear fuel. It wasn't. Um, it was um, Yucca was chosen by Congress uh, in what was uh, affectionately called the, uh, the Screw Nevada Act uh, because uh, it's near enough to where we tested bombs and things like that. That uh, and Nevada doesn't have many people to uh, many uh, votes in the House of Representatives. Um, so it was. It wasn't scientifically chosen. It was politically chosen, and uh, yet the um, and the industry's been trying to backfit the science to match the politics 
for for close to 20 years now. It's not a great site. There are better sites, but the process is going to have to start again, and the industry doesn't want to wait 20 more years. So we're trying. They're trying still. Uh, the House of Representatives just uh, yesterday, I think, uh, passed uh, some sort of a bill encouraging the NRC to uh, open up Yucca Mountain yet again. Now, of course, President Obama made a um, made a campaign pledge that Yucca w- wouldn't start up. So we've got a case where I would suspect if President Obama's reelected, um, Yucca will truly be dead. But if um, if if uh, you know a Republican is elected, then it's likely that Congress will be able to um, uh, to start Yucca up. Uh, after the election. Unless uh, President Obama continues to believe in change. Right. <laughs> yes, you have it. <laughs> this is 5 O'Clock Shadow. I'm Robert Knight in New York. That's Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. And you speak about the uh, Yucca Mountain uh, facility, but there, I think there might have been yet another reason why the um, other commissioners have uh, pushed uh, to have him ousted on behalf of the industry. And that is, I remember... Gregor Yasko uh, doing a public tour of the Fort Calhoun nuclear station at the time of its greatest jeopardy, and uh, speaking about design basis errors, flaws, and taking into account the lessons learned from Fukushima. Do you think that's a factor also? Oh, certainly. Um, yeah, he and uh, the uh, plant I'm very active in now on the West Coast, San Onofre, he's also been very active, not trying to shut it down, but just a regulator trying to regulate. And unfortunately, uh, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, when you try to regulate, um, that's not uh, that's not something that the other four commissioners really want to happen. Arnie Gunderson, uh, there is yet another issue in regard to the operation of the NRC, and that is uh, something that may actually be at issue in a meeting of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that is taking place right now, even as we speak. And uh, this uh, meeting comes amid what uh, seems to be an inevitable push by the commission to allow the nation to be exposed to used nuclear reactors, reactors that have gone decades beyond their intended lifespan, that face embrittlement and uh, cracks and other uh, issues. Can you speak to the uh, the monumental extension of the lifespans of these plants under the NRC? Well, most of the plants are, are over 30 years old in the United States, and a large fraction are, um, are pushing 40 years old. The oldest one is 43 years old. But there's a large group that came online between 1970 and 1976 that are now hitting their 40th birthday. Um, the NRC pretty much routinely has granted all of them 20-year license extensions. Everyone that's applied has gotten it. Um, there's, you know, about a, a one-and-a-half-year process where they have to show the paperwork's in order and they and they move forward. The NRC has now started a process to take a, a look at licensing beyond 60 years. So you got the initial 40 plus this 20 giveaway that they've uh, that they're giving every reactor. And now they're looking at relicensing these reactors yet again um, from 60 to 80 and then from 80 to 100 years. Uh, th- you know, there's obviously um, lots of mechanical problems uh, that are going to be encountered. The, the two biggest in my mind is concrete. You know, concrete in the ground, anybody who's had a foundation in his house knows that over time the moisture in the ground attacks the concrete. And um, um, the groundwater underneath the base mat of these nuclear plants is attacking the concrete. It's incredibly difficult to, uh, to to look at the foundation underneath a nuclear plant. So I like to call it don't ask, don't tell. You know, the, uh, the NRC is not asking about the condition of those foundations and the industry is not telling about it and everybody's happy. But um, uh, so the biggest concern is can concrete stay in the ground for 60 years and still be as... Uh, uh, as rigorously certifiable as it needs to be in a nuclear plant. The second piece is, is the, the plastic, the insulation on wires. You now, anybody who's had an old wire and twisted it knows that the insulation snaps. And so um, it's not clear to me that you can expect the plastic insulation on all these wires to, uh, uh, to last 40 years, let alone 60 or 100. 
So the NRC essentially wants nuclear power plants to have longer lifespans than the people who invented and designed them. Yes, and and probably their kids as well. You know, the industry's position is, is that, um, all right, let's assume you've got a plant that's 50 years old. Um, they need about 10 years to uh, to build a new power plant. So they need some assurance that a 50-year-old plant could be relicensed or they've got to start building a new one. So they're pushing the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to come up with a policy um, before these plants turn 50 years old so that they know whether or not they need to build or whether they can rely on the old um, the old plant again. And that's you said that was the industry side of this argument. But you know, my position is that uh, uh, these plants have been um, uh, you know you squeezed as much orange as you can out of this orange juice, and now you're just down to the pulp, and it's time to uh, you know, to dismantle it and start fresh. Arnie Gunderson, uh, this has certainly been. Um a long-awaited revelation in the many topics that you've covered today. And uh, if there are things that I've not brought up or we've not said yet, I give you this uh, closing moment for what uh, concerned and aware people might do. Well, let me just say one last thing, and thank you uh, very much for having me. The, you know, the nuclear industry would like us all to believe that um, that nuclear power plants should run and that we can store the nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years. Those same people are saying that solar is impossible because we haven't figured out a way of storing sunlight overnight. Well, if we can store nuclear waste for a quarter of a million years, we can certainly figure out a way of storing electricity overnight so we can have baseload solar as well as baseload nuclear. Well, thank you so much, Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. Uh, the work and uh, your many uh, timely reports on uh, such issues can be seen at the website fairwinds.com, and that's F A I R E W I N D S. And uh, we uh, also congratulate you on the successful tour and publication of your book, Fukushima of the Truth in the Future. And we'll stay in touch with you and be back. You'll be back real soon. Thanks, Robert. It's always fun to talk with you. And uh, give our best to Maggie as well. This is 5 O'Clock Shadow. I'm Robert Knight.